wind me up or me. All right. Hey, everybody. We got 10, 10 and climbing online. Um, good group here in person. So as usual, we'll start with updates and I'll kick it over to Jeff first. Yep, for those online, Jeff Bird, Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So uh, in House and Senate, you know, all the individual bills have passed. Uh, they're different though. So what happens is they're the conference committee. So Senate and House and Plains folks to get together and reconcile differences. So for the legacy bill, which contains six million dollars for a forever green, the first meeting of that conference committee was this past Wednesday. It was what they call the walkthrough. But, so they just looked at and what it was contained in each bill. So that's the first conference committee out of the gate. So answers are the legacy bill, which includes clean water funding, they knock on wood, be the first one to finish. So um, I never give numbers too much until the end game, but uh, you know, six million is in both the House and Senate for Forever Green. So that's a good deal. On Monday, there is conference committees for both the agricultural bills and as well as the environmental bills. So agricultural certainly has Forever Green and continues to really cover provisions in it. And then environmental indirectly could affect the folks on this call and in this room as well. So, uh, good first steps. You know, the three that uh, I follow the most are the first three out of the gate. So, um, yeah. chances are that maybe the first that are finished too within the next couple weeks. But we will see <laughs> what happens. So, but good news that they're moving. And timeline is everything's finished by May 20 something, right? Yeah, 20, yeah, 20 something that first Monday, whatever that 20 is. Great. So yeah, some somebody from Forever Green will be uh, or buddies will be testifying on Monday morning, it sounds like with this ag conference committee. So likely me and or some other Don or somebody like that, just just going and saying, here are the two bills. Reminder, this is what this is about. Here's what we'd like to see, kind of the best of the both of both of the bills is, is going to be the message most likely. Um, other big update earlier this week, uh, the was the first ever meeting congregation of the entirety of the Forever Green Partnership, which I think most people who come to these meetings and do research under the Forever Green umbrella might not even be fully aware of. Um, so we should do an update, especially for now, we have prettier and simpler ways of describing this very complicated partnership, but we had 30-ish, 30 plus people in a room for a day and a half representing this research core, our commercialization team, um, the folks like Friends of the Mississippi River, Minnesota Environmental Partnership, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, who work with us on policy and related efforts, other nonprofits who partner with us in a, in a wide variety of ways, the Land Institute, Greenlands, Blue Waters, a lot of core partners that have worked with us over many years. Um, this was the first time we got together and could see each other, kind of see the whole and figure out how we can be more coordinated and you know, make more progress on moving our vision forward collectively. So it was, a, it was great. It was very energizing, tons of excitement and ideas flying. Um, clarifying in many ways, and then of course you realize the next level of stuff that's unclear, but that's what you get to work on. So it's good. Uh, and I would just say one thing: uh, spending a day and a half with that set of 30, 40 people. What was exciting to me was a lot of the people were young, right? In terms of the excitement, that there wasn't just a bunch of well-established folks like myself it was really exciting to see that what the work that we've all done together has to develop a wide range of interest in young people that are going to be the lead folks around these issues into into the future so for me that was really the really exciting part cool any other announcements we have a bunch of field days coming up. So the work that you guys have in the field, uh, people are demanding to see it. <clears throat> so there's gonna be a series of field days coming up. Uh, the earliest one will be on uh, May 11th uh, with the- Clean Water Council, right? No, no. 
11th is the uh, oh, oh yeah the Minnesota Agricultural Water Certification Program. So another yeah Minnesota. just colleagues. Um, this is a group that goes farm to farm to farm across the state, works with those farmers, helps them evaluate their current cropping system practices for potential water impacts. And if there are concerns based on that simple modeling they do, then they recommend changes, provide resources to help with those changes. And we want to be integrated with that. It's basically an army of people across the state who are talking to farmers one-on-one. -on -one. Great opportunity to educate and you know provide new options, which are these CLC crops. So that will be on the 11th. So you're seeing soon we'll see and then we're going to see a proposed tour schedule. Um, and we'll identify. So I, I laid it out last night and just looked at the potential stops. So there's a potential of nine stops. We're, we're not going to be able to do all of those, but so we'll have to sort through and decide as a group, you know, the most appropriate stops for each of these tours that are, that are, that are coming up. So the next one after that would be the Clean, clean Water Council Legacy. The funding that we were just talking about, the six million. This is a group that that uh, suggested that level of funding. So this is the core group that watches us, pays attention to us, and the Department of Agriculture makes a recommendation to, and then they make recommendations to the legislature uh, for the funding that 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 is available for a lot of the work that all of you folks do. Right, so. This is the first time in a long time they've actually been here in person. We had them uh, virtually uh, two years ago. And a number of you participated in that, that uh, they will be coming. So the plan would be to have a, uh, an overview presentation, a tour of the fields, and then Beth Dooley uh, will serve one of the uh, famous Forever Green Meat lunches again. And we're, Trying to get set up so they can they can uh, receive uh, some beer. <laughs> There's rules. There's rules, you know. <laughs> uh, they'll probably be 25 on the Clean Water Council. Will be fewer, I think, in the uh, the tour on the 11, 15, or 15. Half. There'll be 25 people. So I'm getting. Uh, uh, Transportation set up so we'll move be moving people down in the big bus or a van, series of vans. And then <clears throat> the other big one, uh, there's other small ones that I'll probably just do myself. <clears throat> but the other big one will be coming up is uh, on June 7th, 7th uh, with the St. Paul Garden Club. And that's a very energized group, very supportive of the work that you guys do. And there'll be another 30 folks from uh, the St. Paul Garden Club. And uh, it's a very powerful garden club, a lot of interest, a lot of influence. So we'll be setting up a similar event. So this is, they were here last year, they've demanded it again this year. So strong interest so we'll set up a kind of a modified tour for each of these 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 three and then there's other ones and i'll probably contact you in, in various individuals uh, on smaller tours of four or five six people i get those calls all the time i usually just do it myself all right shall we Yep. All right. Are you ready to share, Lucas? <laughs> yeah. So this this um as you should have permission if you yeah. don't. Okay. This session is gonna combine two relatively new areas of research related to Pennycrest specifically. Um, at least some of it is relevant to Camelina as well. And yeah, we're excited to have these folks. So Lucas Roberts is gonna kick us off. Okay. So actually, Aaron's about to off. I was just saying, you know, okay. a broader picture here of the program and how we're working on Pennycrest within the Introduce all your folks. And, <laughs> introduce all your folks. 
Oh, yeah. So I'm Aaron Lorenz. And here in the room with me right now is Lucas Roberts, one of my students in the group. I'm a soybean breeder and genesis here at the, at the university. I've been here for eight years now. And uh, we've, we've been working on this penny press project for, um, I guess, three years now, Lucas. And it's funded by the, primarily funded by the I prefer uh, program. So, so I want to show you the next slide here, Lucas. So just a, a broader context here related to the sodium breeding program. It's a multifaceted, broad-based program. We work on anything from variety development to developing new breeding, breeding methods, making them breeding more efficient, more effective, and so forth. Of course, we are highly interested in educating uh, future plant breeders. And then finally, related to this project, we're also very interested in identifying new traits and new sources of germplasm that can be used for breeding soybeans for future uses, future uh, diseases that, that could come up insect pests that are on our radar, but not yet a problem yet, and as well as new cropping systems. And so that's where this project fits in, is that we're thinking about what soybean might look like for new intercropping systems that could be, you know, on, on the predominant number of acres and, you know, when. So. so in terms of the hammer that we use to accomplish this, in terms of variety development, we have a, a pretty standard single seed descent type breeding program where we funnel things through increase the testing intensity as our numbers decline. Hopefully we get new varieties out of this and keep going through with this. Sorry, some animations here I forgot about. And this is what the, uh, the program looks like uh, as a whole in terms of more details. And uh, I guess some key things here is that we're able to rapidly advance generations by leveraging the winter nursery in Chile. And then we have a really good multi-testing network uh, throughout the whole state where we combine uh, we combine our presence on research and outreach stations all the way from Rosto down to Lamberton. And we also have several farm cooperators that we work with, as well as we do things on St. Paul campus. And so it's a lot of work to maintain this uh, multi location testing network, but I think it served us quite well. And then if we if we uh, do all that effectively and efficiently, hopefully we we gradually increase yields and uh, the power of selection through plant breeding has demonstrated that you can make you know, you can make good genetic gain through through selective plant breeding, even though it's incremental and gradual. As you look over over decades, you see a over a twofold or about a two and a half fold increase in soybean yields over the decades. So, we want to just uh, continue that process and become more efficient because uh, genetic base is becoming narrower, and we have to apply more resources and be more efficient with the resources we have to continue that rate of genetic gain. So, in terms of Again, what we've done, I guess, uh, as a as a community of soybean breeders, community of plant breeders, more broadly, is that we accomplish this through just by crossing the best by the best, right? Primarily, we make wise crosses, select the best parents. Hopefully, we make some good crosses that are that are not too closely related to each other, so we get some good genetic variation. We can find those new segregates that are better, and we have to combine that with wide scale field testing and genotyping. And of course, we need to have a good understanding of our target population environments. And um, of course, then we also have to identify traits that are relevant to our target population environments. And so this definition of population environments is really important for a plant breeder. We have to know what and where we're breeding things for. So next slide, Lucas. So for the last several decades, all the decades that, that are represented by that genetic gain chart that I showed you back two slides ago, the target population environments look something like this. And so we mean monoculture, right? Growing soybeans, planting them in May, harvesting them in in about uh, late September or October, and it's been pretty uniform throughout the vast majority of the state, the vast majority of the Midwest, for the vast number of years here that we've been doing soybean breeding. But now we have a potential new target environment that we need to start breeding for, and that could be more intercropping, more double cropping with other crops as more interest and opportunities arise in these crops uh, to incorporate them into the landscape. And so this is a quick picture of what that might look like. And Lucas, Lucas will show more of these types of pictures. So in terms of adapting soybean to this new target population environments, we have several different resources at our disposal. A really valuable resource is the USDA germplasm collection of soybean, which is currently housed in Urbana, Illinois. It contains about 20,000 or so different soybean collections. They've all been genotyped, they've all been phenotyped, and it's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity that we can go into and dip into if we need to modify soybean in some sort of way to adapt to some sort of new need, intercropping need, new cropping system need or a new pest or disease or what have you. Next, Lucas. So there is a lot of variation out there in some basic, for example, soybean architecture, shoot architecture could be 
a feature that we'd want to modify for adaptations to new cropping systems. And there is quite a bit of variation out there actually in soybean shoot architecture uh, within soybean. Even though you look at soybeans, you look at my, uh, sometimes it's kind of depressing when you look at my breeding nursery out here, but they also do plants look really similar. <laughs> but I, I, I promise you there's a lot more variation out there that we can leverage uh, for a project like this. So here's just some examples. We actually right now have a funded NEPA project in my program um, that looks at aspects of uh, shoot architecture, their genetic control, their variation, their relationships to one another, canopy coverage, light interception, so forth. So we, we've been working on this as well. And you can see that there's some images of different uh, soybean accessions and different soybean breeding lines. You get quite a range of, of uh, variation in architecture in terms of branch angle, branch number, branch orientation, branch length, uh, and so on. So <clears throat> kind of putting this into into one picture here relating the, the uh, variation within elite commercial varieties, of course, is quite narrow, but these things are high performing. They're highly adapted to our current target population environments. But as we want to, as we want to basically move into more larger pools, broader bases of genetic variation, we're obviously going to pull from things that are less adapted and lower performing. So our goal as uh, breeders is to most efficiently dip into that genetic variation and leverage it for adapting uh, to new cropping systems without having to go all the way back to the drawing board that our uh, you know predecessors worked out decades ago. And is this me or you? Yeah, this is okay. So okay. I'm going to kick it over to Lucas. So Lucas now has been leading the charge of this project related to looking at specific aspects of soybean and how they could relate to uh, different cropping systems, and in particularly in this case, uh, penny grass. Can I ask a question? Yes. So. Um, the, the genetic variation that you're talking about in terms of architecture, mm -hmm. uh, that is in the base germplasm unmodified genetically. That's right. A lot of that is native. But there's a, a program <laughs> that developed here where uh, we use techniques to form mutants. That's right. I was just going to say that some of those images actually came from Bob Stupar's population. That's what I was asking. So we're, we're combining both of those things. That's what I'm just asking, right? So, so did we find some new things? Yeah, if you go back to that, that image. Mutantized some of these program. things are mutants. Uh, that, that one up there in the upper central with the starts with the M, that's the mutant population. Uh, whereas, uh, go back one slide because there's a couple others in here, like that strange one in the upper left hand corner, that's a uh, mutant from Bob's population. I don't know if it's worth anything or not, but you know, no, but I'm just saying but there's variation. But you're, so you're finding some new things yeah, out yeah. of that program. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yes. Well, you see them. No. In the new population? Yeah, there's so yeah. much variation. Yeah, there's a lot of variation. If you can think about the trend variation there, mm -hmm. but how independent are those phenotypes that you require? They're a bit Um all those are very terrible. Like all of them. Yeah. The, the the next slide we have the leaf strip down. That's pretty good. Yeah, for, I mean branch angle, or branch length, and branch number. Of these these things have a pretty high heritability when you look at them under standing standard planting conditions, standard row width, and things like that. We're actually doing a study right now to look at the influence of row width on the plasticity, yeah. the plasticity of these parameters, but. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's one thing about soybean is it's highly plastic. It's suit architecture adapts quite readily to the to the row spacings, planting densities, as well as Lucas will show picture cropping too. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to, you know, in corn people are really anal about their exact planting density, and soybean farmers are pretty loosey goosey about their planting density because mm -hmm. it adapts, right? It branches out and puts pods in the branches, and there's a lot of flexibility there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the cropping system, give a little context, a little background. Um, so this would be a relay cropping system, but some of you might be familiar with a double crop where the two crops are separated by time. So relay cropping is when they're all separated by time, but they produce an overlap. So in this system, there's around six to eight weeks of overlap. Of, so it means growing with pinigress, competition for resources. And so pinigress, for those of you who might be unaware, is a winter annual. So we plant it later in the fall. Um, one really important aspect is you need enough moisture to get the penny grass started. So last fall was very dry here. And so we're seeing some struggling penny grass stands right now. Um, and so our target planting date for soybeans is actually right when the penny grass is starting to bolt. You can see there's a little bit of flower development here. 
Um, yes, we do run over the penny press with the planter, but it just pops right back up and around um, two hours later. And you can see here, my trial, the agronomic system that we're promoting is a skip row. So I have three rows of penny press and a skip row where the soybean is going in. Just to give me a little buffer zone to get the soybean established before, as you can see in June, that penny press canopy totally covers up. So I promise you there are soybeans underneath this canopy, but you cannot see they are growing. And so here's a little more of an on-ground depth image. So my soybeans are in a very small juvenile state, and the penny grass is shaking. So I want you to imagine like you are that soybean. There's competition for resources. Okay, that penny grass is blocking light. That penny grass root system is taking a lot of moisture out of the soil. Um, but there's also other biological aspects. So penny grass has really strong um, glucosinolate profile. So allelopathy is present. Um, in some studies, up to 100% of wheat seeds are prevented from germinating while penny grass is alive. The root exudates um, are experiencing this allelopathy, this uh, chemical warfare, um, as you might think. But being winter annual, come early summer, as soon as it starts to heat up, it readily senesces, readily dies. So come July, the penny grass is harvested. And you see the little soybeans are alive underneath, um, a little bit stunted, a little bit stressed out. But as soon as they're exposed to the sunlight, they're really, um, really able to adapt. Like Aaron said, they're very plastic. Given different conditions, they can adapt to them. Um, and then once that penny crest is harvested out of there, soybeans growth is quote unquote normal. So it progresses, the canopy is closed. Um, some traits are affected in um, just very short duration of when they're competing resources. And some traits, as I'll show later, are actually affected year long. But even though that penny crest stress is over, the plant is not able to respond 100%. Um, one thing I want to point out really quick here though, is all the weeds, in this alleyway. So great weed suppression on pennycress is live, but as soon as that pennycress is dead, weed, later season weed become a problem, which in the agronomic management might be an issue because those soybeans are already flowering. We went over applying herbicides is over. Um, and this over here shows in October where for the most part, um, soybeans are acting normal. Maybe a little shorter, maybe a little less canopy coverage, but um, surprisingly not that worse for wear. So, Going through a couple of the objectives of this program, like Aaron outlined. So we're trying to develop new soybean varieties that are adapted to finicris intercropping conditions. And so that might extend to other intercropping conditions like camellia, winter annuals, or some of these varieties might even be ideal for a winter rye um, population where leopathy is also very strongly present. Um, and so one of my main goals here is to minimize soybean yield. I understand that some of the promotions for penny grasses were increasing yield on a per acre basis. So even though that soybean yield is decreased, that penny grass yield um, will be sold for either food or biofuel. And so my goal is to really minimize that soybean yield um, reduction, but that's long-term goal. The breeding program is an eight, nine year cycle. And so that's longer than my PhD program. So some of my work is very early on in the pipeline. He doesn't know he's staying around for eight years yet. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so trying to really just identify target traits, the idiotypes that we think would be well for this system, um, as well as looking at diverse germplasm and seeing, okay, which varieties might serve well as parents for future breeding pipeline breeding purposes. And so along those lines, um, Aaron and I had developed this really trait-informed approach. So what traits do we think are important? This is through anecdotal evidence, things that we've seen, um, and also how they pair with Pennycrest, because as you might think, the pennycrest feeders will have different objectives if they're breeding pennycrest for a monoculture or for the intercropping system. And so some of the things that we're thinking about, highlight and bold, I'll go over quickly, would be cold tolerance. So in order to plant these soybeans into the pennycrest stand, we have to plant them a little earlier than is normal. So the soil might be cooler and wet. Um, reduced elation. So these soybeans are experiencing this high shade environment. So the light quality and light quantity is affected. And trying to look at some shade avoidance systems. And actually, we're looking at varieties that don't respond to shade. We don't want these ED related plants, which have a greater likelihood of lodging, um, as well as rapid canopy closure. As soon as that penny press is removed, I want some plants to respond very quickly, close this canopy, intercept as much light as possible. Um, there's some other uh, aspects that we talked about, like allelopathic tolerance. Um, other things to keep on your radar, Pennycrest is an alternate host for SCN. It's a bad host, but it is an alternate host. 
So some of the writers we're looking at have some novel SC and resistance, as well as there's potential for white mold. Um, pancreas is also a host for um, white mold. And just maybe to have a little quick intercropping. So intercrop pancreas. Pancreas breeders are trying to get shorter plants. They don't want to be too tall to lodge. But for my system, I want that pennycrest sleeps, the seed capsules, these pods to be above the soybean canopy. If they reduce that, when that combine comes in, there's a potential for harm. So some of our objectives are counter, are opposite. Hey, it's, uh, I don't know if you folks can hear me. It's Matt Lovett here, the uh, new Forever Green uh, agronomist. Is Camelina also a host for white mold and uh, soybean cyst nematode? Okay, so I can speak on white mold. White mold has like 800 species of hosts. So I'm assuming it is. Um, I cannot speak on Camelina. We've never seen it. Okay, Russ says he's never seen it. I've okay. seen it in spring, but not, not in winter. It, it's, it doesn't last long enough in the summer. It, it's harvested before it becomes a problem. Is that true of pennycress as well, Russ? Uh, I would say yes, because pennycress is usually, you know, a week to sometimes two weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. Although with some of Matthew's new varieties that are getting closer to where pennycress matures, um, but yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't really be a problem in pennycress either. So along those lines of it's a bad host. The soybean, some soybean cysts will attach and live, but do some of Cody's work, they show that population should not increase. Okay, so gotcha. thank you. Taking a step back, looking at some of uh, my experimental design. So this experiment is using a split plot design. So some of you might not be familiar with that. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons to split plot design. That I'll go to in the next slide. But first, so we're looking at 40 different genotypes. So as Aaron said, there's a wide, wide diversity of genotypes out there. And so part of this panel that I'm characterizing further include PI, so plant introduction lines. These are lines from the USDA germplasm collection that are a little less elite, but they might have novel traits. Um, some of the University of Minnesota um, soybean breeding lines. So Aaron's predecessor was breeding for organic systems. These organic systems also maybe had faster canopy coverage, as well as maybe just higher stress tolerances, as well as we have some commercial lines. Um, so within that three broad pools of germplasm, some of these have novel forms of SCN resistance. Some of these were bred for organic systems, so potentially would be better in the system, as well as some were targeted for fast canopy coverage, um, canopy closure. There's two treatments, pennycress and control. So I want to take a note here to say, the pancreas genotype we were working with is MN106 non shatter. So, this is not that elite of a variety. This is what was available three years ago. It's a black seeded. <laughs> but I'm excited. This summer, this fall, we finally got our hands on some yellow seeded pancreas. So, we're going to look at some of those interactions. Um, there are three blocks here with two treatments in each block, as well as five environments. So. This data that I'll present next was collected in Rosemont and Morris in the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. And so, to maybe refresh your memory about like what a split plot design is, logistically it's easier. That means I'm playing my penny caress in these big blocks. It's not a factorial design where they're all randomized. Um, and with that, there are some assumptions. We are assuming the whole plot error, i.e. the treatment, is larger than the subplot error, i.e. the soybean genotype. And so there's some power trade-offs with that. So I'm sacrificing the power to detect my penny crest effect. But on that same hand, on the other hand, I'm increasing my power to detect the genotypic effects, which is what we are most interested in as soybean researchers. And so just looking at a broad summary of treatment effects, I have my four main agronomic genotypes here, yield, maturity, height, and lodging. So when these when soybeans are grown under pennycress, on average, yield is reduced by 10 bushels. Now I want to say that it is environment dependent, and I'll show the different environments in a second. Um, some environments saw no difference. So that's great. Pennycress is not reducing soybean yield. And so there's a caveat there, it's very environmentally dependent. Um, in the year of uh, Rosemont 2021, we had a very strong drought. And so that drought really saw soybean yields reduce up to 24 bushels. So that's a big factor. Um, I want to say this is across 40 genotypes that are not necessarily adapted for the system. 
going forward, maybe we can select one genotype or one set of parents that can really resist that change. Um, interesting effects here with maturity. So under pending dress, swimming maturity is actually delayed. Um, there are certain effects like greater soil moisture, other disease biological effects that are actually delaying soil maturity. So maturity is classically defined as a very um, great straightforward trait. It's day length sensitive and that's it, day length period. But we're finding there's other factors that can influence it. And so this might be also slightly deleterious. We don't want farmers waiting for harvest an extra two, three days. Um, looking at soybean height. So under penny crest, my soybean height reduced by up to nine centimeters. Um, and so that, this is actually what you would not expect. So in the shaded environment, um, you would expect edulation. So these taller plants, we're actually seeing the shorter plants. So something is affecting the plant height, um, as well as lodging was only relevant in a few environments. And just as a note, this is on a scale from zero to five, um, but pentacrest to reduce lodging likely is a factor of reduced height. Shorter plants are less likely to lodge more. Quick question on the height. Yeah. Um, so I have seen that like the soybean seedling height could be taller. Yep. But then on the picture. end of season height could be shorter. This is end of season height. Yes. This is end of season yeah. okay. Final height. Final height. So you can still get the edulation, but the end of season height. Correct. Ends up being shorter. Okay. Correct. Right. So there is a reduced number of internodes. There are other factors affecting final height. There's one question in the chat. Peter, can you elaborate? Um, I don't quite follow your question. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, just uh, asking uh, the 10, uh, 10.67, oh. is that pound or uh, what is that? What is that statistic? Is it a percentage or a um, weight bushels yield? Per acre. This is yield, bushels per acre. 10 bushels per acre on average across five environments was reduced. And so. So it sounds like that's about 15 to 20% yield reduction. Yeah. Yeah, primarily because of the Rosemont location. Both of those are really dry. Gotcha. Really dry. Well, droughty area other than the sand plain in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. In dry years. In dry years, yeah. Or, except for dry years. Don't do this experiment in Rosemont. But in, in 2020, it worked out really well. In 2020, I was actually remarkably, I was really impressed with the similarity. At, at the end of the season, you couldn't even tell the difference visually in the plants and the yields were not that good. Well, it's great to have that site because as we all know, outside the sand plain, this Rosemont is a very stressful environment every year. And there's those extreme years. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a good site to have some of this work on because it, it shows you what can happen here. Right? So it's a, it's a good stress site, but it should be defined that way. Right? It's, okay. Yeah, so just taking a quick look here at some of the significancies of our treatment by genotype um, interaction. So this is important. This is telling us that okay, there is a genotype by treatment interaction. Some genotypes perform better under pentacrest. Okay, that is really validating us. There are is diversity that we as soybean breeders can exploit, can work on to actually develop a more adaptive variety for this system. Um, and you can see that also for some other traits. And so looking at some of this environmental variation that we talked about. So this is looking at yield. And you can see the two Rosemont locations on top, they were significant for yield. Under Pentecost, some yield was reduced significantly. Uh, but other environments did not see that. And so I wanna really put on that caveat. Here is some um, UCA drought monitor um, pictures for the growing season. Um, this system works as long as water is not, not limiting. Yes. I also noticed that your harvests were really late July. Right. So so that harvest of pancreas. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it was based on what you showed, your yep. date was July. So there could be some variation in that. So I said that yeah. window between competitions maybe six to eight weeks. Say if you reduce that window, harvest pancreas sooner, yeah. you might have re Reduce, reduce, yeah, yeah. greater soybean yields. So I'm just wondering why, why, why were you harvesting so late? Was it so that that's timing or physiological maturity? So um, as soon as that pentacrest was sent as we within harvesting this year, a pentacrest growing on campus is so delayed. I'm worried that harvest is going to be two weeks later than previous years. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, he's just worked with Rust and Samantha Harvest and the Justice Force in these trials. So. No, I'm just saying, you know, just, just talking, I mean, that's really late you know, for Pennant Press. Yeah. But everything was late this last spring. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like a month late. Yeah. I'm just saying in relationship to the data set. Yeah. Right. That's the other factor in there, right? In terms of of um, yield reductions, you know, in relationship to what we're trying to develop and crest, the time we want it to mature at. It's, it's so the meters are trying to get early maturity yeah. variety. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I said this variety is not that elite. That would help a lot. So what variety was it? And then 106 non oh, yeah. the, <laughs> the one that you collected the original uh, you took form. Well, why didn't you talk? Post Minnesota. Why didn't you talk to me? Wrong road. Wrong road. Yes, yeah, so looking at some of the genotype by treatment effects. Um, this is plotting uh, my 40 different genotypes. And there's a really interesting story here. So some of our highest yielding soybean varieties over here under monoculture yield, only yielded middle of the road under penny grass. So this is really telling farmers, okay, it might not be the best idea to go out and buy commercial varieties for this. There really is a need to develop varieties adapted for this. And so along those lines, this blue line here is a one-to-one -one line. So all varieties saw reduction yield. Some saw a very small reduction. So my pointer is missing, but that top blue plot there is one of our target varieties. It saw a very minimal reduction in yield. Um, and so these are the traits that we're looking at trying to characterize like, why was yield barely reduced to this? Are there certain aspects that we can exploit um, towards developing new varieties that are adapted? Okay. And so when we look at all these traits of correlation, there's a really interesting story that appears. So a little bit of background. So soybean monoculture, there are some correlations that are historic that are expected. So yield um, is highly correlated with maturity, lodging, and height. So what does that mean? That means a later maturing soybean has higher yield. Okay, we know that. Also a taller soybean has higher yield and a soybean that is more likely to lodge. So these are challenges that soybean breeders are trying to break those correlations on the regular. A soybean breeder wants shorter plants that mature early and don't lodge. Um, what's interesting though is under this penny crest system, we're seeing those correlations be even stronger. So under penny crest, correlation with yield and maturity is more than this lodging correlation with height. Okay, so that's almost um, a worrisome sign, things to be aware of. Okay, I'm trying to get shorter, shorter soybeans for my monoculture. Okay, maybe there's a need for a separate breeding pipeline, separate breeding program saying, well, under Pennycrest, because it reduces height by 10 centimeters, maybe I can reduce some of my stringencies on height um, given this positive correlation. The blue makes it look like it's positive, though. So, so in maturity, what do you... Well, I'm looking at the height. Yep. Taller height is correlated with more yield. I thought you said you were breeding for shorter, though. So this is natural correlations that exist. <clears throat> Up here in Minnesota, our yield will always be less than the yield in Iowa and Illinois, Missouri. They have taller plants, later maturing. I think taller plants, more pods, more, more nodes, more pods per nodes. This is something that I don't know, the interaction that well, I mean, exists. We, we want to achieve shorter plants, but we want the same number of nodes. We want shorter plants. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's nice that tall plants get a lot of nodes, but uh, they're more likely to yeah. fall over. Right. So there's actually a lot of variation for internode length. And if you look over time, actually, the plants become more compressed. We have the same number of nodes. Gotcha. So they're more compact. They stand in the wind. The soybeans never lodge. You can notice that they never lodge up here. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, the intercrop one, that's a 0.9. That's a high correlation. So yeah. the yeah, the intercrops were generally shorter. So but um, the one that yielded the best, the tallest one uh, in the intercrops, like it was not the commercial line. What line was it? So that was a commercial line, BS1146, fresh drill seeds, red for organic systems. Um, these are correlation traits that we've seen across 40 genotypes. This is not on a specific genotype by genotype level. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're questioning about the height of that line. It was not the tallest. It was maybe I mean, three quarters quartile range, so it's up there, but not the tallest. Okay. We're going to have to examine some scatter plots with those correlations because that's a remarkably high correlation. Mm -hmm. 40 some. 
worse, worse than the eye. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, so looking at some of the physiological responses, as Matt pointed out earlier, um, those seedlings are quite mutilated. So on the left is under pentacrest, on the right is a control. Um, that mutilation extends for the first few notes. Um, on the middle here is showing pentacrest on the left and control on the right. This was in the drought of Rosemont 2021. So drought is really affecting these southern plants. Reduced canopy, reduced height. And so on the right here is an image setup, um, image analysis setup that I created to actually try and characterize some of these more physiological response on a plant architecture basis. And so looking at some of these plant architectural traits, branch number and the distribution of pods, um, this data is incomplete, but presenting today some of these trends. Um, in this location, yield was not significant in treatments, but in Rosemont 2020, it was. And so in that control versus pentagrass, we're seeing reduced number of branches under pentagrass. Um, along those lines, we're seeing fewer pods on those branches and fewer pods on the main stem. So let's try to characterize, okay, how is pentagrass affecting soybean yield? Well, it might be reducing soybean yield because it's reducing branches and because it's reducing number of pods on the branches. So trying to figure out, okay, maybe if we select a variety with more branches that's resistant to this reduction in branch number, um, that might be the way forward. But I do want to point out real quick that that was an average across my 40 genotypes. When you look on specific genotype by genotype basis, some varieties actually saw an increase in branches. So under pentacrest, which is very surprising, not what, not what we would expect, but it is what we're looking for. Okay, I would like more branches on the soybeans and say this pentagrass stress is causing that. And so on the right here, while in general, there are fewer branches that are pentagrass, there are four or five lines that are showing positive slopes there. So these are our target lines saying, okay, something interesting, unexpected is going on, maybe we can exploit that. And some of them just point out some of those varieties also on the other side of Bitcoin really crash. Really crash. The branch number on some of those varieties and all of a sudden pentagrass branches completely go away. So something to watch out for if you're going to be again selecting varieties for these systems. Um, and so looking at some of these internodes, we can actually uh, plot out that elongation, that elongation of internodes. And so this is about right when pancreas harvest, right where these internodes converge, where they become more normal. But prior to that, under intercropping, internodes for the first three, four nodes are seen as um, elongated. And there's an interesting uh, relationship here with soybeans to see that dip and then increase. Right around that node three and four, the soybean nodes are stacked. This is the transitory period between where the energy of the cotyledons is running out and the soybean has to support itself. I'm just taking a very brief look at canopy coverage here. So we in the soybean breeding program fly drones um, to record canopy coverage on average once a week. Um, I want you to really just focus on the very left side, very early season, prior to pentacrest harvest, sorry, after pentacrest harvest, but still prior to canopy coverage, this pentacrest treatment is reducing canopy coverage. But later in the season, right around uh, 80 days after planting, we're seeing that convergence. So on average, our sodium varieties are able to close the canopy for the most part. Um, as I said, this is not on a genotype by genotype basis. I expect there to be differences. And so this is, towards the end of my slide, we're just looking at a little bit of future work, some other aspects. Okay, so I just described um, our yield trials, but going forward, I'm trying to quantify, okay, what is allelopathic tolerance in soybeans look like? Is this something that we can describe the genetic architecture to maybe uh, import, to maybe put into the newest varieties that we are promoting for the system? And so allelopathic tolerance is a very difficult trait to measure. I've tried Pentecost T, so having a liquid solution. Um, this scenario that I really like the best is look, looking at ground up pentecrust seed in the soil. And so there are four different genotypes presented here on a vertical, on a column line. And so you can see versus control versus treatment, there appears to be genotype differences in soybeans so we have back in tolerance. This is very interesting, um, not well characterized at all. But there are other uh, interesting aspects, influence of soybean growth and development that is looked like is causing. In general, we're seeing some stunting, some delayed growth, as well as some apical damage, some <clears throat> increase in branching. And so these are important things to realize, okay? This is how pentacrest can affect soybean uh, growth and development. 
And as a breeder, what can we do to maybe resist that or exploit that? As I said, increased branching would actually be a good thing. Did you ever grind anything else up and dump it on your soybeans and see if you get the same response? <laughs> There are a lot of as a weed scientist reading that literature my entire life. Be careful, because mm -hmm. yeah, you can dump ground up plant material on yeah. from a wide range of sources and get that same damn response. There are so, other so be careful components in the seeds such as tannins, which have shown um, deleterious effects on plant growth. So we are working with Adrian Hageman and Hort to try and let's actually isolate the glucosinolate synagrin. So we're only applying synagrin to try and reduce some of this confounding factors. So it's an ongoing process. So in the system, when is the when are the weeds exposed to synagrin? So From the fall through plant your soybean. So how are those soybeans exposed to yeah. synagrin? So pentagrass blue has come in three different flavors. One is in root exudates. These plants are actively um, exuding compounds into the soil. There are volatile chemicals. If you walk in a pentagrass field, it's smelly. It smells like red lobster gargles. <laughs> so <laughs> this is that high <laughs> sulfur. <laughs> <laughs> it's nauseating. <laughs> <laughs> These high sulfur compounds of glucosin rates are in the air affecting. As well as soon as that pentagrass is dead, that stover has the ability to decompose and then release the synagrins into the soil for longer and later season effects. But you have a long experience to prove that, right? So I'm just thinking. This. You're questioning if pentagrass is releasing allelopathic chemicals at all? Uh, whether they're whether they are the reason for the, the response, right? In terms of, I think about it in the context of, of weed suppression. Right. So what is suppressing the weed population? Um, personally, I think it's right. the ecological principle. If you're there first, you win. Right. So I'd love to see experiments that would actually tease that out. Right. That you give that same level of, of light modification. Uh, using tools that don't extract water or don't release. And my take was that I think you would probably see that response if it's not associated with synergon. It's my take, but well, I'd love to see that for that really do. And so one of the ways that we talked about and actually proving that would be getting radio labeled C13 gas apply to the pentagrass and track that synagrin is being exudated by the roots, being uptaken by the soybean and be found in the soybean. That's just, that is an experiment that we talked about with Adrian, but there is a global shortage on C13 for the next two years. So we cannot do that experiment. No, I'm saying back, you know, these are the classical. Let's, let's, know. let's transition. <laughs> we spend, we should move to right. Bob's presentation yeah, sure. and we're going to hold the rest of the questions well, till the end. So cutting it off. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people to thank. Um, this is really more than it's important to do. All right. So, thank you, you Lucas and Aaron. Um, and Bob, if you could try to wrap up like 1.20 so we have a little time for questions for both groups, that would be great. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pennycrest entomology. I've been kind of dabbling around on the periphery of the Pennycrest larger effort for the last few years, skimming data off of plots when I can, when people are kind enough to let us go in there and look for various insects. Um, Want to point out that most of this work has been done first by Arthur, who's a postdoc in my lab, and then now Ellen, who's a master's student. So anything I'm talking about is we, it's certainly the royal we with many of them actually doing the work. Um, just a quick overview of what I wanted to cover today, just briefly what we do in my lab, since I don't know most of you too well. Um, and then for pennycrest entomology, um, what are potential pests of the pennycrest plant itself, right? If this is gonna become a crop, what insects could be attacking it? Um, doing some artificial defoliation to try to get a feel for how pennycress would respond to insects that are chewing up the leaves. And then 
implications for other crops in the rotation and kind of building off of the system that Lucas and Aaron were talking about. <clears throat> so my lab, um, we focus on soybean entomology, um, pest biology, ecology, integrated pest management. Um, got my students there. They're um, sometimes harder, sometimes easier to manage than the pests themselves. Um, but the pests we work with, we've got soybean aphid, which has been here for about 20 years, causing problems, and a couple newer pests, the soybean gall midge in the middle, which is a maggot, and it feeds inside the stems at the base of the plant. And then the newest critter is that little caterpillar at the bottom that makes its living inside the soybean leaves. It's a leaf miner. And we do things, you know, looking at insecticide efficacy and uh, insecticide resistance, post plant resistance. You know, so started um, some work with Aaron's predecessor, and that's continued on to pretty fruitful collaborations, I think, with Aaron's group, looking at aphid resistant soybean, biological control. So, looking at, you know, the, the good insects out there that are feeding on the pests, predators, parasitic wasps. And we've been doing a lot of work with sampling and remote sensing for farmer decision making, trying to decide when to apply insecticides to protect yield. But getting into Pennycrest, kind of my entrance was back in 2019, getting an email from Rattan saying that some of the plots that they had on campus, they're seeing flea beetles chewing them up. And it seemed like it was more on some of the low glucosinolate mutants than on the wild types. Well, Kind of piqued my curiosity, and then uh, that's where I passed Arthur, the postdoc, to start collecting some data, and that kind of started snowballing from there. Um, so the potential pests of pennycress, just a little bit of background, why I think it could be an issue, right? So we've got pennycress growing as a weed, right? Kind of scattered across the landscape, interspersed with other plants. On top of that, it has these glucosinolates, which you know could mess up other plants in the system, but those are defensive chemicals that also help protect that plant from herbivores, plant feeding insects. So if you're one of those plant feeding insects, that might not be a great scenario for you, except there are certain insects that have evolved to specialize on these glucosinolate containing plants. Um, but for most insects, it's probably not a great situation. But through the greater efforts of Forever Green, you're breeding for less of these protective chemicals, right? So these plants might be becoming more susceptible to insect feeding. You're gonna be packing them into a field. So you've got a bunch of these uh, more susceptible plants now packed together, probably less genetic diversity there. So that could be a situation where some of these insect pests could become very happy. So what are we trying to do on this front? Um, past Ellen with doing a literature review to look across the literature, figure out what insects have been reported feeding on pennycress. And then from some of our sampling on campus where we've been gleaning data off of others plots, um, figuring out just what insects are out there on pennycress growing in Minnesota or more specifically St. Paul. And then trying to see if we see any differences between some of these genotypes. So for the literature review, no one's really paid too much specific attention to insects on pennycress because it's a weed who really cares. But it's been mentioned in some studies, you know, especially where you've got like cruciferous weeds growing near cabbage production. Some people are concerned about these alternate hosts in that environment. So we've been able to get some information there. But overall, I think it was over 100 species of herbivores associated with, uh, with pennycress. You can see the, the insect orders. So that top one, that's like the true bugs, aphids. Then you get into the beetles, that's Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies. Um, and they're feeding on all different parts of the plants, from the roots all the way up. So for actual field work, like I said, starting back in 2019 and then continuing it each year since, plot sizes have varied as different people's plots for the breeding and genomics work has kind of varied. Over those years, we've just kind of taken what we could get, but we've been mainly focusing on the, what we've been calling the wild type is MN106, and then the um, nutty mutant, or I think AOP, where it's got the low reduced concentrations of the glucosinolates. And you can see some of the main insects that we've been finding kind of matches some of what we saw in the literature review, where we've got aphids, flea beetles, diamondback moth larvae, so that's a caterpillar. 
certain kind of leaf miner that lives inside the leaves and some of the true bugs. So these are just combined counts across three years of the survey. And for sake of time, I left out some of the, the temporal data where we look at when the insects are showing up in the growing season, but I can share that with anyone who really wants to geek out on bugs at another point. But here, just kind of the season long average, and this is for just the flea beetles. Um, 2019, 2020, 2021, the black bars are the nutty mutant, and the gray bars are the MN106. So in 2019, we see a higher number of the flea beetles on the nutty mutant, and that's what caught Raton's attention and David Mark's attention back in 2019. Um, so I think it was a marginally significant <laughs> difference there. The other years, no difference in numbers. Diamondback moth, um, we see that they were actually tending to perform better on the wild type than the mutant. And this might be because that's a group of insects that's evolved to, it, to yeah. feed on brassicas, right? So for whatever reason, they like those group of scintillates. And then, so those two previous insects are what we call the foliators. They got chewing mouth parts, they chew holes into the leaves. Aphids are different. They've got piercing sucking mouth parts. They stab them into the plants and suck out the juices. And here we found no differences among or between the two different genotypes. 2019, we had much higher abundance of aphids than those other years. And I think it was probably due to drier conditions in those other years. Um, and that's a, a log scale on the y-axis. So just really briefly to wrap up this part of it, again, looking at the literature, over a hundred different species of insect herbivores associated with pennycrest from North America and in Europe, um, from our field sampling. On St. Paul, right? So limited geography. Again, keep in mind these are very small plots, and we know small plots can affect insect movement. You get weird behaviors. So some of this would be really cool to do this kind of sampling in large, like real size fields or plots of uh, penny crests. But you know, we were just taking what we could get. But aphids, flea beetles, diamondback moth, caterpillars seem like um, the insects with the highest potential to maybe become pests. And response to genotype. It kind of varied by the insect that we were looking at. In addition to what I showed, Ellen's got some laboratory studies where she's doing petri dish choice tests and no choice tests, where you can find the insect with a leaf of penny grass and, and either force it to feed on it or die. And then she can quantify how much it's consumed or give it choices of two different kinds of leaves and see which one it prefers. So she'll be able to share that information at another time. Um, now getting into pennycrest response to defoliation. So some of those more abundant insects we saw are these defoliators, chewing holes in the leaves. So essentially they're reducing the leaf area out there. So um, the goal here, you know, what effects does the intensity of that defoliation and the timing of that defoliation have on pennycrest biomass and pennycrest yield? I was thinking biomass because it is a cover crop and a lot of cover cropping systems, those ecosystem services or benefits, I think are a lot of times related to the amount of biomass there. And then obviously the value of the grain yield, right? So pictured in those pictures there, those are the uh, pretend insects, not chewing on the leaves, but using a little sister, uh, scissors to remove leaf area. Um, this was uh, done in 2021 and 2022, again, using what, uh, is apparently Don's least favorite genotype, MN106. Pretty small plot sizes because we were just squeezing in this experiment where folks had some extra penny crust that we could work in. So, you know, one row by two feet for each plot, um, randomized complete block where we had combinations of defoliation intensity and timing. And this little table shows the two years, what growth stages we were at what growth stages we were applying that defoliation. So the rosette, the flower stage. And then in the second year, we added the seed pod stage. So the beginning of flower, the beginning of seed pod, and then defoliation intensities, 25% of the leaf area moved, 50%, 100%, and then obviously a control in each year. So here's some pictures from the first year for what those plots look like. In the top, you can see where we were making the cuts on those rosette leaves. Um, 
we opted to leave a little bit of the petiole there. And then at the beginning or flowering stage, you know, where we were making those cuts on those stem leaves and kind of the level of destruction that we did to those plots. So then at the end of the season, at maturity, harvested the plots by hand, um, put them through a threshing machine, and then uh, Ellen and undergrads did a lot of the detailed work getting seed counts and weights and all the different uh, yield parameters. And show you quick here, some of the, uh, these, this is gonna be biomass results across the x-axis, we've got the treatments. So the uh, different growth stages, and then under that, the defoliation intensities listed, and then biomass in grams on a per plant basis on the y-axis. So we can see that as defoliation intensity increased, biomass decreased, and there wasn't a difference between those um, growth stages. So for the second year, well, let me just skip ahead to yield for 2021. We saw a similar pattern. So this is yield in grams per plot. So again, uh, yield is decreasing with increasing intensity of defoliation, but no differences <clears throat> between the growth stages at which it was applied. I'm gonna try to go back to find the biomass slide for 2022. So we added on some extra treatments here. Um, and the only difference treatment we saw that was different from the control was 100% defoliation applied at flowering. And now going to the yield for 2022, a very similar pattern. And now if we try to summarize this, putting the two years of data together and looking at percent maximum yield, right? The yields kind of differed between years, but if we standardize across years by looking at percent maximum yield, so the controls obviously have a 100% yield, and then the other treatments decreasing the yield. We can see the different timings and then the intensities. And then we've got the two years, the solid line being 2021, the dashed line being 2022. So that's biomass across the top. And then here's yield across the bottom. Here's that there's a very high correlation between these two measures. And our hope next is to do some regression analyses, you know, to get some slopes to this and kind of bigger picture down the road. It'd be really cool to, you know, utilize some of this information to maybe try to develop some treatment thresholds where if pennycrafts, pennycrafts is planted in a field and a farmer's concerned about losing yield or biomass, at what point should they think about applying an insecticide application to protect that crop? Um, so basically what I just said. So implications for other crops, so this is getting to the work that Lucas has been doing and Aaron, and another example of us skimming data off of other people's plots. <laughs> With their permission, obviously. But what we're thinking here is when you've got these intercropping systems or relay cropping system where you've got a period of overlap between the two crops, you can have different scenarios playing out. You can have bad situations, which are created by like the green bridge kind of phenomenon where a pest might start developing on the one crop and then transition over to the other. And we know this can happen in cover cropping systems where, especially with uh, rye, fall planted rye, planting corn or soybean into it in the spring, and especially with army worms. This is a picture that Claire Lacane took from extension in a cornfield that was demolished, right? The uh, army worms migrated in, found that rye very attractive, laid their eggs there. Once that rye was terminated, you reduced the food source for those caterpillars. They became very hungry and moved over to the corn. How often does that happen? You guys know. Not very often. I think it's a fairly rare phenomenon, but when it happens, it's pretty big like this, right? So that catches people's attention. Yeah. And it's not only in corn. Um, Anthony Hansen, also from Extension, I think it was last year, went out and saw this field where that's actually a soybean field. You can see some of the remaining soybean plants, and it was army worms that got rid of all those other plants. Wow. Um, so again, it, it can be a big issue just because you're cover cropping doesn't mean you're going to create this issue 
right? Lots and lots of fields, probably most fields will never have an issue like this, but as an IPM extension person, it's opportunity for me to breach scouting, right? Get out there, assess the populations and decide if you need to do something rather than just prophylactically spraying, right? Having that increased diversity there, right? Not the monoculture, but having another plant growing out there as well can have good impacts. You know, and some of the ecological theory behind it is like resource concentration hypothesis, having uh, a polyculture makes it harder for the herbivores to find a particular plant or to stay on a particular plant. You have the natural enemy hypothesis that suggests that having that polyculture there makes it more hospitable for the natural enemies, natural enemies being predatory insects or parasitic wasps, different things like that. And the plant quality hypothesis, I think, ties into what some of what Lucas was talking about, where you have those two plants interacting and the one might decrease the quality of the other. Maybe it's through competition, maybe it's through allelopathy. Um, all those could affect what's going on um, with the plants. So just a quick example from some work I did before with rye and planting soybean into it. We found less soybean aphid on soybean plants grown in a rye cover crop than in a monoculture. So we were curious to see if this would happen with soybean grown in pennycrest. So once I heard that Lucas and Aaron were working on exactly this, you know, asked if we could go out to their plots and non-destructively sample, and they were nice enough to let us do so. So kind of the object objective, you know, does this relay cropping of soybean into pennycrest affect soybean insects? Lucas talked about all the methods. He had this huge experiment with like 40 genotypes. Um, Ellen didn't want to sample that many, so he said she could sample just two of them. So she was just picking out a few of those treatments within that larger experiment. But with those two genotypes, getting plots with pennycress and plots without pennycress. So essentially a, a two by two factorial for what, what Ellen was looking at. And she had those two locations, St. Paul and Morris, and it was just done last year. Um, we were going out counting insects on the soybean plants. It was mainly soybean aphid out there. And then we converted those daily soybean aphid counts to what we call cumulative aphid days. It's kind of how the aphid pressure on the plants accumulates over time. So as agronomists, a lot of you know how degree days, growing degree days accumulate over time. Same kind of thing here. But instead of temperatures, we got aphid numbers on plants. So on this graph, we've got the treatments on the bottom, those two different genotypes. And within that, the genotype with pennycrest and then growing without pennycrest. And then we've got cumulative aphid days on the y-axis. So this was Rosemont. And here we see that the two genotypes did not differ. The varieties did not differ. But that cover treatment with pennycrest or without pennycrest was significant. So there were more aphids on the soybean grown with no cover crop than the soybeans grown with penny crust. And that penny crust was 106. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make that clear. <laughs> At Morris, there's a similar pattern, um, but you know, p-value of 0.07, so I guess what we call it marginally significant. Um, so kind of in a quick summary, relay cropping here of soybean into penny crust. At 106. Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> it did reduce soybean aphid populations. We've got counts on other insects as well. Um, we just haven't had time to analyze though, but them yet. But the numbers were quite a bit lower. So I, I don't think we'll see too much there. Um, so what this is suggesting to me is that incorporating some of these cover crops into the Minnesota corn soybean rotation be it rye, like some of the previous work that I did, or pennycress with some of this recent work, has potential to potentially reduce pest infestations, especially soybean aphid. But we need folks like Aaron and Lucas and others to figure out how to prevent the two crops from competing with each other, right? Well, I'm you know, kind of making fun of that, you know, 106, but that's the other component to make sure mm -hmm. we have that indication. But also, as we continue all this work to make sure that as the varieties of pentacrests are developed that we yeah. make sure we know what the hell we're talking about in terms of how the, the new right is right so could other genotypes of pentacrests yeah, have exactly. different yeah. impacts yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Then, um, Frank yeah. just uh 
excuse me, if I could just uh, jump in here. Frank just put something in the chat that I wanted to point out as well. And that is um, the penny crest is a very attractive species for hoverflies, of course, which are uh, predators for aphids. And Frank has uh, shown that in his publications. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And that kind of ties back to that, you know, that one ecological theory of the uh, natural enemies, you know, where the, that polyculture, and especially if you've got another plant growing in there that has some resource that could be provided to those natural enemies. I guess enemies. that's the point I'm making. I think we have a whole new set of opportunities to look at a wide range of these things. Mm -hmm. You know, as yeah. we do this in both, as you well, from negative to potentially very positive things. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a quick overview. Those are just kind of the key points I think that we can pull from some of this work. All right, one question for you. Mm -hmm. What percent of the soybeans planted in the state of Minnesota are treated with neonics? Less than corn. You know, corn is probably pretty high that, soybean. Yeah. I, I don't know for sure, right? I hear different numbers, you know, maybe 50%. I mean, what I'm saying back to you, do we, what level of concern do we need to have? You know, you showed those insects on the, the pentacrest. Mm -hmm. um, so concern in what sense? Well, the uptake of the, the pentacrest taking up that the, the, neo, the neonics being transferred to the pentacrest. It's possible. Well, do we know that? Uh, I don't think anyone has looked that? at that with penny press. No. As far as I know, I, <clears throat> I do not know the answer to that question. I think it's possible, but it's, is, there, is it is there much persistence in the just in general between any two crops, one summer, the next summer, to do you mix off of treated seed from or spray on one crop, transfer and translocate into the plant the next year? Um, again, I don't know, but if I think I, this is a different scenario where you've got that penny press growing, and then I think it would depend when you're planting that treated soybean seed into it, right? Is that before, during, or after flowering? Well, the neonics persist. Yeah, they do. I, I don't know for, for how long what the half-lives are and how much is being taken up and expressed in that nectar of pollen, there, right? Yeah, the point I then thought about that, that right as it's about to flower, you put a whole line of neonic treated seeds right next to it. It could be. Yeah, if you got enough moisture, then move yeah. that um, neonic off the seed into the root system of the, the pancreas. There's a chance here. There's a couple other points too to bring out too about this, these studies. Um, one is, is something I don't know anything about, and so I'll, I'll say something anyway. And that is the fact that uh, penny crest has fairly shallow roots, and so they create a, a negative water potential fairly high up that draws water up into the system. And so I'm wondering too, in a double cropping or uh, relay cropping system, is that benefiting the, the soybeans by having the, the penny crests draw up some water? into the system where it might be more available to the soybeans. And so that's a, a question. Um, a bigger issue is your, your studies with nutty, I wanna caution you on anything you do with the local casinolate stuff until you take a look. Uh, I sent a picture to Mitch and what Mitch has is a, a picture of uh, the trials and uh, tribulations that uh, the folks in the uh, canola world went through in trying to bring on uh, low glucosinolate canola. And uh, the big issue, what they found was, I don't know, Mitch, do you have that picture? I'm pulling it up right now, yeah, one second. Okay. And so the big issue uh, that they had was um, the um, low glucosinolate plants grew like crap. And so here you can see on the uh, left is a, a local glucosinolate plant. Uh, and this was planted into a field where there were some feral, single zero uh, high glucosinolate plants. And you can see the difference between the local glucosinolate plant and the uh, high glucosinolate plant. 
And what the difference here is, and what they discovered uh, the problem was, is that when you were, it's kind of counterintuitive because glucosinolates are sulfur containing <laughs> molecules. Um, but in fields where there's a deficiency of sulfur, um, what happens is, is that the low glucosinolate plants suffer greatly from a sulfur deficiency. And so later studies have shown that the glucosinolates actually serve as a sulfur reserve that's very important for the growth of the plant. And so right now in my field, I have some studies going on where I'm applying different amounts of uh, sulfur to the low glucosinolate lines to see if we can uh, recover that. And in point of fact, in the canola world, the um, uh, folks there recommend 30 pounds per acre of sulfur in some form per acre of sulfur to, to get the plants to uh, perform. And so up to this point, I would say anything you've done with the local glucosinolate plants, um, I would take it with a grain of salt. I think David, is your point that is your point that without sulfur supplementation, they're just probably not performing to their potential. And as they as, 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 they as you can see in the canola world, that's uh, certainly the case. And what we've seen also in the pennycrest world is up to now, uh, our uh, local canola plants have flowered later. They've been smaller. They produce less, lower yields. The seeds are smaller. Um, but this year with the added uh, sulfur, the plants are looking much, much better. Sure. Well, it's a good comment. And I mean, one thing we have done is try to adjust the insect counts based on plant size as well. But yeah. Much more work. In regard and, and regarding the, yeah, the, the insect biz, I mean, in my small little world, uh, what I find is uh, when I do see the flea beetles, um, they are mostly around the edge of the field. If you look at plots in the middle of the field, not so many flea beetles. And I uh, attribute that to the fact that the borders of our fields are just covered with um, um, shepherd's purse, capsella, which is probably serving as a kind of a reservoir for uh, keeping the flea beetles happy along the borders of our fields. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And you know, like I said, these are very small plots and there's a lot of criticism about such small plot kind of work. And so that might be some of your variation from year to year that you might see on the flea beetle side if you're not paying attention to where those plots are actually located. I have a couple of quick questions for Aaron and Lucas. Um, have you, um, I know we chatted a couple of years ago about trying different planting depths for the soybean to try to reduce the overlap between the penny crest and the soybean if it can emerge later. Have you tried anything with that or do you have any plans with that for that in the pipeline? Yeah, that's a good point. No, we haven't done anything like that yet, unfortunately. I don't think planting deeper makes a later emergence that much. Um, some of the, I do want to make a point that point though, of our 40 genotypes, we have quite a difference in seed size. So some of these maybe have larger seeds yeah. that might um, be a target trait for us. Maybe a large seed, more energy in the seed, has a better, stronger seedling. Yeah. Yeah. Any way to um, reduce that overlap between the two crops? I mean, I know there's some polymer coatings too that delay the uh, germination of the soybean. So something like that would be interesting to, if you can reduce that overlap because soybean, you can plant it and still get, you know, 100% yield. And, Mid May, right in mm -hmm. southern Minnesota, <laughs> but you can't plant it <laughs> in pennycrest in mid May. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, any way to do that would be cool. Like, yeah, to look into. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for reminding me of that Matt. I forgot. We, yeah, you know, just kind of fell by the wayside. We should. Is there any? You have that special experiment about your plants. Is there any room in that experiment to do some cool things like that? So we talked about that like two years ago. I don't think there are any commercial polymers out there. There was a company that did it and they got bought out and then the product never came to market. Yeah, Russ, I know Russ has done work with the polymers. He published on it uh, like 10 years ago. Russ. Yeah. You know, any polymer soybean stuff? Yeah, that um <clears throat> yeah that got bought up and it kind of got top shelled, but or I mean bottom shelved anyway. Um and I don't think it's being used right now, but um 
Yes, I, I've thought that would be a great idea to, to have a polymer coating that would, you know, delay emergence. You don't want it delayed too long, but, you know, at least a, a week or two, I think would be beneficial. Um, so that technology is out there somewhere. I don't know who has it. Back yeah, when, I mean, that was what, 20 years ago or so, or 20 some years ago. Um, I think Monsanto bought it up and and then I don't know what happened to it after that. Yeah, Kevin and I did a lot of work with, with the, the uh, coatings for uh, cover crops in general. The idea of putting the cover crops in at the time of planting, but delaying the germination to you know, much later in the season without having to come back in an application, do it all one shot planting, but have delayed, delayed germination. Um, so there was some interesting things, but we were working the same damn company, okay. right? Sure. That all of once that technology disappeared and we didn't take the time to reestablish. But we have a lot of polymer chemists uh, here on campus, right? And I made contact with, but I never got the resources to follow through with those folks. So there's capacity within the institution. Uh, to to do additional polymer work uh, outside of existing companies. I mean, to do some basic science um, in, in developing you know, polymer uh, coatings for, for this work. I think it'd be nice if we could resurrect some of that. Yeah, I, I can give you, I can come up with the names and I know they're still here because I've interacted with them on other things. They're still around. And it's a matter of uh, getting a team in place and actually developing some limited capital to get something started. And then Lucas, you also mentioned that the Pennycrest plots had more weed later in the season. Mm -hmm. And I don't know soybean that well. What's the latest you can spray herbicide on soybean? My understanding is as soon as the soybeans start to flower, that's your like R2 when they're almost done flowering. Because the risk is some of these herbicides can cause pollen and abortion. Okay, I don't know if you. Well, that's, that's certainly true for the, the, the different types of herbicides. Um, probably those are, you can probably spray a, spray a grass herbicide. Mm -hmm. What about glyphosate? Yeah, I think you can, you can apply that for your leg, right? Not even that, but glyphosate only works on plants that are three to six inches tall. Like yes. at this point, I think the weeds are off label. Oh, gotcha. Well, but there's a whole set of opportunities. And since you know you have to have some weed management, I would suggest what Kevin and I have done over the years is use a pre emergence herbicide. Get it down at the time of uh, planting the soybeans. That's, um, yeah. yeah, so that, that was our, that works. Yeah, that was our solution. Okay. And I do want to comment, so in this greater I prefer grant, there is a collaborator weed scientist out of Ohio State University who's looking at these different uh, chemistries and application times for the system. Um, so to be determined about what's appropriate, what's ideal. But, but a lot of that work has been done here already by Kevin Betts. So you guys need to take a look at that set of information. Kevin was working on that for the last uh, 10 years. So he has a great data set that that group actually published off of, right? So you have local capacity, there's a data set that's in place uh, that you ought to take a look at, okay. And you, you would spray it pre or top of any crest after you plant the soybeans, is that what you're saying? What one did the pre go on? Uh, we could put it on, uh, you, you could put it on uh, any, sometime in the spring. Yeah. Could could you ban? Uh, I don't know. Could you ban yeah, it at the know, same? Any grass is tolerant once they're established to the pre. -emergence. Once they're established, oh, I see. Okay. 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 So he's done it in the fall. He's done it in spring. So he has a full yeah. data set that you can take a look at. We we, we didn't have a pre down, and the weeds were. <laughs> I was going to say channel. Well, you should have talked to us. Right? So so that work has already been. Yeah, a lot of that has been done. I haven't. I think they didn't want the major limitations of the system. So, so I guess raising my hand is not the polite way to do it. Uh, 
but sorry, it's hard to track. <laughs> so, so I have a couple of comments. One about uh, David's uh, an interesting thing about sulfur. Um, ATP sulfurylase, which is your primary step for sulfur assimilation, is a stress um, a stress related uh, expression enzyme. So it's possible to actually breed for uh, high ATP sulfurylase uh, expression in these lines. And that might actually be uh, the, the dichotomy between a sulfur containing compound and a uh, um, glucosinolate minus that um, uh, doesn't give you uh, uh, the predicted. That is, you expect something is making a sulfur compound to be more susceptible. That's not true because glucosinolates are involved in stress responses. So just something to, uh, you know, if you want to breed for a gross phenotype or a particular enzyme, this one would be a good one to breed for a particular enzyme. The second one was I was eating my lunch and I caught something about Adrian saying there was a worldwide shortage of uh, C13 CO2, which is true, except I'm sort of... Uh, um, been raised that we should not stop doing experiments just because things are um, difficult to get. We just finished growing uh, C13 tobacco, Adrian and I, with uh, c hect over in the cancer center um, because we're going to C13 label smokers. We figure that's a good way to encourage them to smoke more. Um, but uh, it is still possible to get C13. And for a lot of the experiments that you might want to do with C13 labeling, you can get by with only a 10% C13 enrichment, which makes C13 go a lot further. And I just wanted to add that because you don't want to slow down science just because uh, um, the world carbon 13 production is slightly slower. Uh, it hasn't. I want to thank you for that comment, and maybe you can talk to Adrian on our behalf. We can meet with you. Um, well, I want to talk to Adrian in half an hour. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I think orange is really just proof of concept, like tracking, making sure yes, that glucosinolate being produced in pennygrass is being uptaken in soybean. So I think even at lower concentrations, that would prove that proof of concept. Yeah. Well, anyway, I just wanted you know to to not slow down science. It's um, it's it's not impossible to do these these studies now and. There's lots of ways to make C13 go further. Actually, Adrian argues for using a lower enrichment. And I'm always arguing in favor of using the more expensive experiment. But uh, uh, there's there's lots of possibilities. So you should explore that with him in a um, in, in some detail, because it's certainly not, I just wouldn't put it off to the future or something. It's not uh, it will get it will get better, however, in the future. But Science delayed is is not a good thing. So, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, our speaker had to run. Second speaker, but thanks to the first speakers yeah. and uh, yeah, really, yeah, really yeah. interesting stuff. All right, take care, everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. On that weed issue, make sure you guys talk to us. <laughs>